I heard about his wonderful experiences that he had in the Lord. And I wanted to meet this brother. And the Lord has privileged me to come and to meet him tonight. And brother Grubbs has agreed and, uh, to share his story tonight of what God has been doing in his life in, in a period of about 20, 30 years. And they are fantastic experiences. And I believe in that in the last days that God is going to do mighty, wonderful things. Signs and wonders are going to happen in the last days. And we are excited what God is going to do. And I believe that this is just a foretaste of what we are going to experience in the body of Christ. And so we want to just share with you tonight, and Brother and Sister Grubbs are going to share their testimony of how they came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Brother Grubbs, I want you just to share with me tonight, and Sister Grubbs, just share with us what God has been doing in your lives and how you met Him. Well, I met Him when I was 12 years old in the Methodist Church, living very poorly. My mother was a Christian and my father was a believer. And uh, then years later, when I was eight, 17, I went into church, lived it late, and this young man was leading song service. And the Lord spoke to me in, a ma in an audible voice as a man and said, He shall be thy husband. And uh, I believed it. I just believed it. That's all you need to do is believe things work out. We've been married 51, we'll be 51 years this June. Well, I came into the world in September of 1913 and was taken in by a, uh, I was born to a, a girl, 15 year old girl, who was without a husband. It was kicked out by her parents and uh, so I was put in an orphanage in Emeryville, California. And an elderly couple up in their 50s were taking in children and keeping them for, say, six weeks or two months, and then they would take them back and get somebody else and care for them for a short time. So they didn't become too attached. But because of my illness, I was not very well. I only weighed three pounds and a half with all my clothes on, six months old. Why, they kept me for three years finally adopted me and gave me a Christian upbringing. And later on, when I was 16 years old, I went to the altar and gave my life to the Lord. I didn't really feel anything like an exaltation or anything of that nature, but I believed it. My dad told me that all I had to do was to say yes to the Lord and uh, that was all there was to it. And I will say this, uh, he asked me what I was going to do when I become a man. And I said, I'm going to be a preacher. So one night as I was passing by his chair, he was 74 years old, why he reached out and took me by the arm and he said, son, he said, remember what you said, what you were going to be when you grew up? And I said, yes, Dad. I can remember it so vividly, and God's helped me to remember it, and I, I'm glad for it. And uh, he said, well, don't forget it. And I said, I won't. Well, the next day, the Lord took him home. And, and uh, so I felt then that I had committed myself for sure, because I had told him I would do it. And I had told him that night that I would do it. So I went to Northwest Nazarene College in Nampa, Idaho and got my degrees to be a minister of the gospel. And my first church, I was standing up on the platform meeting song service for the first time I had ever been a pastor. And a lady and some children walked in. and One of them was a young lady, as my wife has said, 17 year old. And I saw her as if there was nobody else there. And uh, we got married. Had a wonderful, wonderful life together. God's been good to us. He's given us five 
sons, and uh, the Lord has blessed us wonderfully as a family. And God has promised us this, that if we train them up in the way they should go to when they're old, they will not depart from it. And that's the promise that we're holding to God, and I believe it with all my heart. You um, you served as an Advent pastor for several years? Not too long in that place. We uh, left there when the pastor, a new pastor came in. Uh, we went in into a Assemblies of God church and uh, worked with a pastor there, a, a wonderful brother. And then we moved away to uh, another city in fact, it was John Day and worked for the minister there. And I more or less just uh, substitute for a good many years until I went into the evangelistic work. And then I don't remember the exact year that we moved back here to Portland. Perhaps you remember. Do you remember the year? 49. 49. And we moved across the street from a church where a brother uh, he was a Norwegian brother that had a family that had this church. And while we was there is when God began to do what he did in my life. And that was where the experiences I had took place, right across the street from that church. The church is no longer in existence. They've torn it down, sad to say. But uh, I've been in in many, many churches and in camp meetings and all over the country, in California, in Washington, Oregon, preaching different places, giving a testimony. Now, when this, this first happened, was it in 1949, this experience that you had with the Lord? 1950. Can you, can you tell us what you were doing that day and um, exactly what happened? Do you recall? What happened that day? Was it in the afternoon? Yeah, we went to church. Uh -huh. It was a Sunday then. Not exactly what uh, I'm referring to at the time. We were uh, when we were had the church down on Halleck Street. Oh. You know. Yeah. And we couldn't stand the lights. We thought it was the lights that was bothering me. It wasn't. Oh yes. When we got home, my name was struck by a blinding light. And he, was, he lay down in bed for 12 hours. And finally, I called this minister he spoke of. And he said, well, you better call the doctor. That was about 9 o'clock at night. And he said, so you won't get in trouble with the law. And the doctor came. He was a head man at the University of Army uh, up on the hill. And he said, uh, this man's been dead. And he smelled death in the house. But he, he had come to just before the doctor got there. So help me to understand. So early in the afternoon, you were seeing some light, strange light. Mm -hmm. and then you came home, and then you were struck with a blinding light. And uh, d did you die? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Apparently you died. You fell right between the bathtub and the washing machine, which was just barely enough room to fall for anybody to fall down there. Was he just left there, or was he removed from that? No, we took him into the bedroom. So he was laying on the bed, and he was laying there for about 12 hours when the doctor came. And during this time he was on the bed is when he saw himself go down to the grave. Yes, I saw myself lying on the bed, and uh, saw people standing around the bed looking at me. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I can remember some of it, see. Uh, remember seeing myself there, and saw myself as I was going down, saw the divider, like a, a piece of plate glass that you couldn't see you couldn't see through it going down. But after you got down, you could see back and see through it and see the heaven, but you couldn't see hell from above. But when you got down below it you could see hate hell. And those in hell can see what they missed up here, but up here they cannot see what's down there. There's a division. 
remember the uh, what, line that by the man that was down in uh, when Lazarus was in the tomb and he besought that he could bring water and touch his parched tongue but he couldn't because it was a separation well that yeah. separation is real mm -hmm. it's real of course it was shown to me as though it was a stretch of glass which it is not it can't yeah. be mm -hmm. but it, it's a real it's a real thing and uh, there's many many times that I've been shown the same thing time after time after time so I would not forget it so you visited hell you saw hell yes mm -hmm. I saw a literal literal and it is a reality, a real thing. And people are there. A lot of people think there's a place in between. But when you reject and refuse to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no place between here and hell that there's a parking place where you can change your mind. There's no repentance after death. Uh, it's, it's either now or never. There are people who believe that uh, you can pray for the dead and they can be saved or changed or brought back, but that's not so. No way. It's our decision. We make the decision while we're alive. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether you serve God or you serve Satan, we can make the choice. He doesn't make it for us. Nobody else can make it for us. I can't make your choice, you can't make mine. And if I say no to God, too many times we sin away a day of grace, it's too, it's too bad, there's no coming back. If it were possible, hell would be empty. If that was possible, nobody would want to stay down there and go through that. And it's literal. There's no destruction of the body. It suffers eternally in that flaming inferno eternally. It's not consumed. You see, death doesn't consume. Death is the end, but it doesn't consume. This body, of course, is consumed in the grave. It, it turns to dust. But when Jesus comes back, he's going to raise this body in a transformation like his was transformed. And this body will be the same appearance because they knew who he was when he came out of that tomb. Yeah. And Lazarus, they said about him, well, by this time he stinks. And he did, or they wouldn't have said it. Mm -hmm. And he did. But when he came out of that tomb, he didn't stink. He just don't do things part way. Mm -hmm. He was all right. And he come walking out of that tomb. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. He was just as good as he was before he ever died. And better, in fact, that he was healed. Mm -hmm. And uh, God doesn't do things part way and leave part of it undone. He does it all, the whole thing. So when we go into the grave, this body we ain't going to turn to dust. But he made us out of the dust, and from the dust we return. But when he again comes from up there to take us home, he takes this body, even though maybe a, a big fish might eat us, he knows where we're at. Because a fish won't keep us. He would deposit us someplace all along the ocean floor, but that don't make any difference. God knows where we're at. He would gather us up, put us back together again, and we'll be, be with Him. And the sad part about it is, He'll do the same thing with those that have rejected Him. But they'll go down. So they'll have a body that can be in the fire to suffer the torments. His life, remember, is more than the natural. It is a life that was eternal. It had no beginning. It has no end. Our life has a beginning, but it will have no end. There's a difference. There's a difference. He has no beginning. He has no end. We had a beginning, but we have no end. If the ungodly can realize that and know it for sure what they were doing, some of them might be more careful the end they chose. 
because there's nothing that they can do about it afterwards. So you saw a lot of a torment, you saw a lot of horror down there. A lot of torment there. and horror. And several years ago, I don't know whether you heard about this or not, but up here at, at the Bonneville Dam, there were some men working on the dam, and one man fell, and he lit down below, and when he lit, it knocked him out. Now, I don't know whether it supposedly killed him or not, but it knocked him out. Anyhow, when he came to, he said, he told those that was working there, that he had gone down into the darkness, and he was about ready to go down into hell. But he saw a person in bright, shining garments, and he knew who it was. He'd been raised in a Christian home, and that's why he knew, apparently. And he cried out to him and asked him to save him. And he came back. But a reason for that, I believe, is because the parents had the promise if you train them up in the way they should go, and it was their prayers that caused him to be able to see the vision of the Lord Jesus Christ and know who he was before he got that far. Praise God for that. Amen. When, when you went down to hell, then you came back out? Mm -hmm. Now that was spirit, your spirit. Yeah, I didn't go into the pit, fiery pit. Mm -hmm. I went under the brink of it and yes. was able to see into it. But those who go down into the fiery pit, there's no escape from it. No. So you came back, and uh, then what happened? And I came back into the, into the, uh, able to see myself lying there on the bed. And then I don't know if there was time to lapse or not. Then I was taken up to see heaven and the uh, glory up there. And that is something that I'll never be able to, to describe. It's, there's no time to describe it. Well, it's like hell. You can't describe that. Either. You can say it's an inferno. Well, what's an inferno? Can you describe it? Not really. Could you, unless you experience something, you can't tell what it's like. It's like heaven. You've never been there. It, when you see it, all you can say is, well, it looked like this, it looked like that, and looked like that. But unless you have really seen the glory of it, then you can't express because there's nothing that compares to it. There's nothing that compares to it. Nothing. It's like when the Lord comes into your life. Can you tell somebody how it feels so that they'll know what it's like? Until they accept it, they won't. But when they receive him, then they don't have to be told. They know that themselves. That's what changes the human person. Makes them what they are. It's not what you told them, but it's what's come to them. It changes them. It's not what I've told them. It may have helped them to decide, but I'm not the one that changes them. That's the beauty of it. Sister Grubbs, were you sitting next to Brother Grubbs while his body was laying on the bed? Were you there with oh, him? We were in and out all the time. Because I had children to take care of. So I just did my housework and stuff with Big Jim on him all the time, you know. But he was hardly breathing at all. And then what happened? That, that sort of 12 hours. And then when we moved over on, that's when we lived on in North Portland here. Then we moved to the southeast where he was across from that church he spoke of. Where he, where Brother Yerstead was his name. And uh, then he went, they had several different experiences there. But he went blind, deaf, and dumb for two weeks. And uh, the Lord dealt with him. Quiet it was. That's where he put the sword down between us so that the Lord could deal with him. And uh, I wouldn't have no interruption you know, there would be no interruptions of any kind now, concerning me. You told me that an angel of the Lord came yeah, and brought a sword down between both of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that the Seven Lord might years. deal with you. Right. 
that's the first time I saw an angel. And that angel was so tall, his head was on the other side, it was through the ceiling. And yet the ceiling didn't appear to be there. But he had to be taller in that room. Oh, he was a monster. Beautiful. The light around him was beautiful. And talk about fear. I'm telling you, I was scared. I was really scared. And yet, when it happened and it was over with, the fear left me. Because I, I realized that it wasn't anything to, to be afraid of. Because if it was going to hurt me, it would have done it. But he didn't. So it must not going to be anything to hurt me, because nothing hurt me when he put that down between us. Could he say anything to you? No, he didn't. He didn't say a word. But you understood what that well, would mean. I, I didn't see him, but I knew that it was the Lord dealing with him, and I didn't you know I didn't have no part with his dealing with him. But at that time, the, the children were small yet, and they went over to play on the church steps the back step across the street and the Lord let him know they were over there. I didn't know they were there. And uh, he told us, told him to not let him do that. They weren't hurting anything, but they were on the Lord's property, you know. And uh, so I called them home. So I thought that was quite a thing. <laughs> Even though it's a least little thing. Mm -hmm. But the, it was prophecy was given and that when it was time for him to come out of his, uh, I don't know what you call it, blind death and down, uh, by Brother Yester would come and lay hands on him and he would be the same God. And so I just waited. Of course, I'm like that. I, what the Lord says is it. You know, I was a, that way with my mother and I'm that way with the Lord. And uh, so I just waited, and one day Brother Yerster came to the door and didn't let me know, see my husband, so I just let him go upstairs to the bedroom by himself. I didn't even go up, because I knew what was going to happen anyway. And he did. He prayed for him and laid hands on him, prayed for him, and came right out. Was Brother Yerster, was he aware of what was happening with you? Uh, when he was over in Sweden, 30 years before, he knew my husband then. He saw him. So he knew who he was when he first saw him. He was a lot older than I But 30 years before, he was revealed to him. While you were blind, deaf, and dumb for two weeks, uh, did the Lord speak to you and, and share with you what this was all about and what was going to happen? Did he say anything to you? Oh, yes, but the Lord himself did the angels came and talked talk to me, spoke to me. And one thing I want to make very clear, people got the idea that angels have wings. There's only three of them that have wings. The angels don't have wings, not like people think they do, not promiscuously. They, they're just like, they like us. They come, they're glorified beings, what they are. But they come and they, can, they talk to me and they told me they, this, what would happen, they can come like that and they can go like that. They're there and then they're gone. And they talk, they speak. They can speak any language there is to be spoken. They know the all of them. And they know just what to say and how to say it so that you understand. You don't have to ask them what you mean. Because they can tell you, they know what you, they know your mind. And they can tell it to you so you know what is being said so that you can understand it. I didn't have to ask, what do you mean? And many times, you know, we have to say, well, what do you mean by that? You don't with them, because they know what to say, so you know what they mean. A lot of them haven't asked the question. So what did they say to you? Well, they told me that they were gonna, I was going to be sent to different places. And Sister, I was for years, I was taken by two angels, one on each side of me, taken to the different countries, set up on top of buildings, and there I would preach, and the city traffic down below would stop, and people would, would listen to the gospel in China, in Japan, and in different places, and were in buildings that were vacant. I'd go in the door, and in a few minutes, 
somebody would come in and say, oh, here you are. And then they'd holler out on the street, and the first thing you know, the whole building would be packed. And I didn't have nothing to do with it. I don't know yet how come. But I was taken over there and brought back. And Dennis made the remark I did a while ago. I walked across the street here one day. There was a big tree over here. And I walked across the street. And down here by the St. John's Bridge was a telephone booth. And this is the strangest thing. I'd walk down there to that telephone booth. And every time I went to that telephone booth, that seemed to be the place where the angels would meet me. Strange as it may seem. They'd come down, and I'd go up with them. Or what anybody else saw, I don't know, except a young lady that is dead now. Did see me one time, and was going to tell the folks she was with, writing with, about it, but she was afraid that it might not go over too good, so she kept her mouth shut, which she did tell me about it. But I was going across the street and went behind that tree trunk to go up the sidewalk, and he said, when he watched me, I got behind the tree trunk, and that was it. He never saw me anymore. Except that you saw the light. You saw the light. So, uh -huh. mm -hmm. so apparently the angel picked me up from that behind that tree. I don't re exactly remember it. And then you said you saw me over there. Somehow. No, he saw you up here by the tree here in the schoolhouse by the chestnut tree. They don't see me, mm -hmm. but they see the angel, yeah. the light of the angel. The light is mm -hmm. what you see. Maybe not the form of the angel either. I don't know. So I prayed. Lord, I want to see, can I see, you know, and I went to bed and the Lord took me to do something that night. And uh, so I hadn't said it but just a second or two and then I was looking out the window and I saw this light, it was long, you know, and narrow. And it says, just stayed there for a few seconds and left. So he answered my prayer. <laughs> So Dennis, uh, Dennis, would you share with us when you saw that your saw what? Just share with us what you saw when your father and one of his when he was being translated. Well, uh, one time I was uh, standing out on the front porch and we walked across the street into the shadow of a tree and uh, I didn't hear something come out of the shadow, so I walked across the street and there was no one there, not in the tree or anything. And another time I was. Uh, about watering about uh, 11 o'clock at night, and uh, it was like something told me to look up, so I looked up there where light across underneath the clouds, just a small white light, and then I used to stay up all night and water out in the yard, and about an hour later, I, like something told me to look up, and I saw a light go the other way, and that happened four times that night, and uh, so I knew what the uh, what it was. There couldn't be any searchlights or any shooting star underneath the clouds at the time. So I, How old were you? Oh, let's see, that was, uh, that was about, probably 27 or Oh, I thought you were a very young boy. Oh, no. no, no. This was uh, oh. just maybe. So you were already in the town? Years old. When that happened, did, did you know? Did you know what you were seeing? Uh, yes, there was a, a knowing inside of what it was. It uh, wasn't anything that had been told to me that that's what I saw. But uh, I just knew what it was. And then later, you know, a Sunday or so later, than the uh, message came that what I had seen, I knew what I had seen. And, uh, so, yeah. did, did your father tell you that he was being translated? Uh, I had known it for a number of years on the internet. What did you think about this? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Nothing really, because it was, uh, it was uh, knowledge that I had, and uh, I knew that uh, what the scripture says, greater things than me that I have done will you do when I go unto my father. So I knew anything that God wanted to do, he can do. Thanks, God. Brother Grubbs, um, one time when you were translated, uh, Sister Grubbs, can you hand me that article? Yes. Uh, yes. This article uh, was sent to me by Sister Gwen Shaw from the End Time Handmaidens called Stranger at the UN. 
And it is an article, uh, an excerpt of uh, an article that appeared in a magazine, and the message was given by Paul Harvey, who is a nationally known news analyst over the network of the American Broadcasting Company on Christmas Eve, 1950. And uh, this article talks about a man who was translated or who appeared in the UN. And uh, Brother Grubbs uh, tells us that he is the man that was translated into the UN. And um, Brother Grubbs, you tell me that you have had um, a stroke, several strokes since then, yeah. mm -hmm. and so it has impaired your memory somewhat. But can you share with us what you do recall of this happening that was written, The Stranger at the UN? Well, I, when I went, I can remember some of it, just a little of it. When I went in, they had guards. I mean, they had them all around. They were, I would say, six foot apart, facing out from the building, all around, where the doors were, of course, because you couldn't get in anywhere else anyhow. But all the doors, they had three guards on each side of each door, facing out, so that you couldn't get in unless you had a pass or something to verify who you were and had a right to go in. Well, I walked in as though I wasn't even there. They didn't even see me. And I went in, went down, it was a, a walkway that went down like this, a, a wide, uh, it wasn't steps, it was a, a ramp like affair, down to the main uh, uh, arena affair like, because it was bleachers or what you want to call it like this, down the main floor where the speaker was to be up on a big platform and the, everybody was around like this, you know, like an old toy. Yes. Well, I wa walked down that. Nobody said a word. Nothing was said until I was about halfway down and some guy hollered at me, Hey, who are you? I remember that. And I turned around and said, It's none of your business. I remember doing that. And he said, hey, come here. And I paid no attention and went right on down. And when I got down to the bottom of the ramp, there was a, a, a seat right next to the aisle. And I sat down right next to a man. And he put his hand over on my knee like this. And he said, welcome, buddy. I don't know to this day who he was. But I have a notion that I think I know who it was. One of God's angels. Oh. <laughs> what I think. He was dressed in a suit. Mm -hmm. You know, you take an angel, most of them was always in white apparel. This guy wasn't. He was dressed in a suit. He said, welcome, buddy. Nobody bothered me. And after it was all over with, he walked up the ramp with me, and we walked on out. But when we got up to the top, and I went out the door, there's an officer confronted us, and he said, hey, I hollered you. Who are you? And I said, get in my name. He said, how did you get in? I said, that's a good question. You answer it. And uh, he looked, and he stopped me. He looked all around, and I was still standing there. He looked all around. And I'm going to say what he said. It wasn't very nice. He said, I to you. I I don't understand why I was there. I really don't understand why I was there. If I had, it was the reason for me being, I don't remember what it was. Maybe something I would, to show them something, for them to realize that something could happen and they wouldn't know it until it was too late, that somebody could get in and they wouldn't catch him in time or what, I don't know. But that guy made that dirty, nasty, filthy remark and I, I was standing right there, but he couldn't see me, nor the one with me. And I'm not transparent. Did you examine your body? Uh, was there any changes in your body, anything supernatural, or...? Not that I recall, says. Now, either it happened to him, all together him, or else the Lord just made me so that he couldn't see me. I don't know what happened. Sometimes he took him in the body, sometimes he took him just in the spirit. That's his body here. 
Now, I don't know whether God can take a spirit and make it uh, physically apparent or not. That I do not know for sure. Says. Maybe he can do that. Well, I shouldn't say maybe he can. He can do anything. Let's put it that way. He may have done it that way. So when you were taken See? just in the spirit, where did you go and what happened? That's what I don't know. In that case, maybe I that's what it was. I think the time you went to Japan, your body was here, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sure it was. I think Lay he told on. me Lay that he's still here. He's laying unconscious for one hour, but he was gone for three days. Yeah. There's uh, people here in the flesh knew that, that he was laying there like he's unconscious. Mm -hmm. But then he was with the Lord. The angels, that's what the Lord took him. You see, time, uh, ta time with man and time with God are, are not the same. Mm -hmm. It isn't the same at all. He uh, went to uh, day like to a thousand years, a thousand years like them to a day, as far as God's concerned. Did I tell you before he went to Anchorage? He went to Anchorage. Then to the earthquake. Yes. You remember something about that, don't you? Yeah, I remember walking up the side of it of a building to rescue a little kid. Yeah. This was right after the earthquake. Yeah, uh -huh. walk right up the side of the building get a little kid out of the, out of the window. And a person can't do that. I didn't climb it, I walked up. And I can't do it. So you rescued this little girl and, uh -huh. and then the Lord brought you back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't you call didn't you call Sister Grubbs from Anchorage? Mm -hmm. He called me from China. I even brought money home to prove I'd been there to show them. Money home from uh, Then he, one place he was here in the United States, he brought home a little, on a little bell phone books, you know. It's just a thin one. From where he was taken. I can't remember. I think maybe that was in Texas. I'm not sure now. Did you say that when you called from Alaska or called from another country, that he didn't cost you anything? That you just picked up the phone? Oh, the because I didn't get the money to spend, you know, I didn't. Oh, there's so many things. Then uh, you remember about the airplanes. Yes, the airplanes, it was this one time particularly, I don't know exactly where it was at, but my memory don't serve me. If I did know, I mean, I've forgotten. It was if in I the air. Know, it was in the air, but I don't know where. That the pilot was having a problem, and he could he was lost or something, his instruments had gone bad. And the Lord took me up there, so whatever, however you want to put it, and I sat on the nose of the plane or out toward the nose of the plane and helped him find his way in. And another time I was sent to, uh, uh, down below Florida, Cape no, the uh, islands down there were, whatchamacallit, Cuba. Cuba, and disarmed one of their uh, missiles That's down when, when Kennedy was in office. Yeah. yeah. And disarmed one of their missiles and brought the piece of mechanism back and took it to uh, Kennedy's office and laid it on his desk. He asked me, where'd you get this? And I said, where do you think I got it? And he said, well, how did you get it? I said, I took it off. And he said, well, did anybody see you do it? I said, if they did, they didn't say anything, and I walked out. So let me get this straight. So the Lord translated you down to Cuba, mm -hmm. and you disarmed one of the missiles. The Lord had you take a, a key instrument off of that missile, take it into the Oval Office, into President Kennedy's mm -hmm. office, yeah. and you laid it down there and spoke to him mm -hmm. and left the office. Yeah. I even went into Nixon's office. You know, he that did. guy That guy was something else, Nixon. He was ornery. He was ornery. He had a gun in his desk. Maybe a lot of people didn't know that, but he had a gun. He kept a gun in his desk, mm -hmm. a revolver. And he, was, he had an awful language. I never cared for Nixon. I never did, not after that. So the Lord translated you into President Nixon's office yeah. to talk to him. To talk to him. Do you recall what you said to him? Uh, not too much, but what I he, he had nothing he didn't want nothing to do with me. 
he told me that uh, he didn't believe any of it. He didn't believe any of it. I said, well, that's between you and God. I said, I've come to tell you what the Lord wanted me to tell you. What you do with it is between you and God. Do you, do you recall what you said to him? No, not really, I don't. Then you talked to Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson, I don't remember what I said to him. He was a fine man. He was good. He was nice about it. But I don't remember what I said. And he's talked to different, different actors. He's he talked to Ernie Ford, which is a fine man. He's, but he's not Pentecostal. Small man, average man. I've met some. Armstrong? No. So, not that I'm The Lord had a purpose every time he tried to Every time. Every, every reason, reason to, I don't remember what they were right. for. And then, then the Lord has humor. Oh, he has more he humor him, than people realize. He took him one time and. Uh, I forget where he took him, but when he come back, he, you know, this Zoe's up here, this ice cream, yeah. it used to be ice cream parlor. Yeah. <laughs> he let him down right there in the parking lot, and this person had the ice cream tongue, <laughs> well, didn't know what to do. <laughs> Boy, what he did, he dropped it. He went out like this, and right <laughs> in his face, and then dropped it, scared him. So there, I don't know what purpose the Lord had in that, but... <laughs> I don't know that the Lord did it on purpose to scare the guy, but they did it scare Then he, he's gone to hospitals, he's gone to nursing homes. Oh, I tossed things. a couple of policemen in the San Francisco Bay one night. <laughs> and I'm not big enough to do that. <laughs> but they weren't going to let me go into a nursing home. It's right on the San Francisco Bay, uh, facing the Bay Area. I'm facing the Bay, just across the goes along the edge of the bay and I was going to go in there and it was past midnight and this these two cops were there and sitting in their car right across the street going the opposite direction the emerging home was over here and they were over here going this way and this side the traffic was over here and I was going to go in and if you can't go in there I said well I think I can so I started to go up the steps and so they come up there and said you can't go in there so I'm a minister, I was going in there to pray for somebody. Not this time of night, you're not. And I says, what you think? And I took them both of them by the arm and give them a flip like that. And believe it or not, they both of them sailed over and lit right in the water. Of course, I didn't think <laughs> that. I didn't it had to it. be more fire than he's got. <laughs> yeah. I bet they're still wondering what happened. <laughs> then he, was, he went to this nursing home down here in Lombard. I think it's men now. They weren't going to let him in the women's park where the Lord told him to go. Because this one woman was there and was praying that God had sent someone to read the Bible to her. And they wouldn't let him in there. He, I don't know how he got in there. They didn't see him go in anyway. And when they found out he'd been in there, the woman in the nursing home, was not the patient, but the, the other woman, was pulling her hair. <laughs> beside herself because he was in there. There was another uh, time that you told me when the Lord took Brother Grubbs and uh, his clothes were left behind. And the Lord spoke to you not to touch his clothes. What was all that about? I don't remember. That's okay. Uh, that, uh, that must have been when they were in the basement. Yes, it was here. the basement. That was here in yes. the house. And uh, when the Lord says something, we can, we just, whatever he says is it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and just leave the rest to him, yeah. you know. There was a time when you were translated, Brother Grubbs, um, when President Kennedy was shot and buried. Mm -hmm. And the Lord spoke to you about watching the television. Can you share? Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Not. No, I don't. A right bag now. on the coffin. Oh, that. Yeah. Oh, yes. that. The first thing. I think it was before the battle flag. He was up in the dome, you know. So was that after the flag? He was up in the dome, and, and the way people were marching by Kennedy's coffin. Who was up in the dome? Brother Gross was up yeah. in the dome. And uh, she, this one woman looked up and she screamed. 
and we saw that on television. And then we saw the, on television uh, where he said to watch the flag, so we watched the flag on the coffin, mm -hmm. and it wiggled like it had been lifted, and he had lifted it to see if for sure if Kennedy was in there. At the same time, one of the guards shifted to wait for it to die. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was uh, President Kennedy in there? Yeah. It yes. was? It was him. Well, so many people were afraid yes. that they didn't put uh, his body in there, you know. It has been said that some of the presidents were not buried in the caskets they were supposed to be in. Of course, I have a way of proving it. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's been said that it has been. Then there was a time, I think I told you about him rescuing the family on the mountain. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, you remember that in the car. Oh yeah, the family was in a big heavy snow drift. And I marked and I had this told me to go up there and took me up there. I didn't tell me what he took me up there. And I didn't want more to do and all of a sudden here appeared this angel. I knew it was an angel, it was a man. Looked like a man and I said to him, Well, this family's in trouble and he said, Yes, the Lord told me to come up here and give you a hand. That's how he said it. And I said, what am I supposed to do? He said, you're not supposed to do anything. Just tell me what to do. And I said, well, you have to lift the car. And he said, well, the Lord sent me to do it. He just picked the end of that car and lifted up and set it up on the road. And left and disappeared. So then I knew, of course, then it was an angel. It had to be. Picked it up and set the end of it up on the road. It was up in nowhere. I don't know where the place was at. There was no place around it that I could see any, any civilization. It was just out in nowhere, and there was three children in the car, little children, and yeah. a woman. Then he, uh, he doesn't know anything about wiring for uh, airplane uh, instruments or anything. And this airplane was in danger, and, and the instruments weren't working, so the Lord took him, and he got down underneath the, like a dashboard, I don't know what you call it, <laughs> in an airplane, and he put, fixed it, and it came in so well, it was in flight. Were, were, were you always aware um, when uh, when he was going to be taken? Oh, no, no. You, you never knew. You just... Sometimes he'd go while I was asleep. <laughs> oh, yes, and I got a chance to throw snowballs at the guys on the moon. Yeah, she... Uh, forget your name. Naomi. Naomi, she asked about Just now I ask. But... Uh, I threw snowballs at them and they jumped and looked around and looked everywhere to see where they were coming from. And we were told to watch the television that time too and we could see, I think it was Armstrong that he threw them at and we could see if you looked close you could tell him something was wrong, you know, that he was evading something. Trying to figure out where they were coming from. Why do you suppose the Lord, the Lord sent you up there? There was another time he went up to, up in space and he looked in the window, you know. I, I forgot, was it Sherelle? And uh, he, he never told anybody about it because, you know, if he told anybody about it, he would, they would say he was insane. The so. guy himself, no. Yeah. Well, he told so, uh, he was off his rocker. And he would have, he yes. had a right to, oh, yes. you know. <laughs> we don't know why the Lord does that. That was like the one that I guided the plane in that night. Yeah. He, it came out just not a couple not of years ago, ago. It came out. Mm -hmm. The man told it finally that a man sat on the front of his plane and guided him in. He told about it finally, but it's been 20 or more years ago that I did. Mm -hmm. But he finally told it. Well, if he'd have told it then, they'd have kick him off the force right now. Yeah, you told him that. You told him they think he'd be yeah, insane. Yeah, not the talent. Cause it but he finally did. So, listening to all these stories, most of them sounds like humanitarian reasons. It uh, was to preserve life, yeah. to save life, yeah. to yeah. preach the gospel. That's the reason. It, there was always that kind of reason that God has such an interest in mankind. Right. That yeah. nothing is too small, that even the Lord would translate you up to Anchorage, Alaska, after an earthquake, to rescue a little yeah. girl. And didn't you give her your coat or something? Mm -hmm. And then the Lord brought you back. Did the angels of the Lord always take you? 
It had to be then, he says, yes, it had to be. He said sometimes no when, when they'd go over the ocean, he, he, had, he would get a fear that maybe they'd let go <laughs> you know, a human. Yeah, yeah. I, I was afraid lots of times. <laughs> One time, and I don't remember exactly where it was at, but there was comedy sometimes, though. The one time I went over a, a place where there was a man had gone into a shed and they closed the door. Huh? Crater Lake. Was it Crater Lake? Up by Crater Lake. And I went, I, the angel let me go down and put a, a piece of uh, a stick up against the door. The door was closed, put a stick up against the door while he was inside. And the horses were scared. And the horses were scared. Succeeded. They took off. They went around that field just a snorting and making all kinds of noise. And when he come to the door to come out, he had an awful time getting that door open because that stick was up against it. I bet he wondered how that stick got up against it. We'll never know why. <laughs> I don't know what that was for. I, I don't know. But I don't think the uh, horses saw him in human form. They saw him and they saw the angels. I don't want the horses to oh, them. It scared them anyway. But uh, the Lord deals with the natural man in the way the natural man can stand to a point in order to get his attention. I think that's the reason for it. And uh, that little child that I got out of that building uh, in, Anchorage, yes. in Anchorage, yes. It was the only only person there. He was all alone. There was nobody else there. Everybody else had left. Mm -hmm. I don't know how how long that had been had happened before I got there. He was the only one there. He left that little child there. And then after all these things happened in your life, you began to share it. And, and all this was during the, the latter rain movement, coming toward the end of the latter mm -hmm. rain movement. And you began to share it publicly. What was the response of the, the ministers and the people as they heard these stories? A lot of them didn't believe it. A lot of them didn't believe it. I held a meeting up in uh, Kennewick, and people came and filled that tent. I mean, it was cramped. And I was there for how long, honey? You remember? I don't remember. Three weeks. And after it was all over with, and they came home, somebody else came in there and set up meetings, and they wiped it all out. What did they say? said it was all a lie, it was untrue, couldn't have happened. And they took their word for it. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I understand. Did you know the minister? No, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. We know he's the minister. The one that did it, I don't know who it was that did it. So what was the result of this? That the people didn't believe your story? So what happened after that? Well, they used to call us or send things to us, write to us, and we never got any more mail, we never got any more calls, and uh, we finally heard that uh, this man came, I can't even remember his name now, that well, came in. No, I probably better not, if I can remember it, even I don't, just as well. But he came in and said it was a lie, it was a lie of the devil. And nothing like that ever could happen. And the people took his word for it. So it looked like it was all in vain. But I don't know. Even if only three or four believed it and it helped them, it was worth it. As far as I'm concerned. So you, you weren't allowed to minister publicly after that anymore? Not in that area. I didn't go back. As far as being allowed, was, yeah, it wasn't a matter of being allowed. Did, did other doors open for you? Oh, yes. Did you yes, still continue did. to preach? Yeah, we had a church of our own after that. Mm -hmm. Over oh, by the Coca-Cola Works. Laurel Hurst area. Oh. Coca-Cola Valentine. We had a church over in that area for a while. And uh, we preached there. And uh, people came there. And, and I think there's some good results. But there's a, a, an awful lot of doubt, and uh, it's too fantastic for them to believe. Yes. God has to anoint it to them, and they can't receive it. And of course, you shared uh, that 
these things happen biblically, and still they would oh, doubt, yeah. and still they would not receive it. Well, you see, a lot of these things that I can't, I've told are not connected in any way with the Bible. Mm -hmm. Only that the thing that the ultimate result maybe might be similar to something in the Bible. But the way it was done, no. But the translations in several yeah. instances in the Bible that were translations. Yes. Many mm -hmm. people wouldn't, won't believe that angels can do things like that. Yeah, they don't. But they did then. They did then. But they don't believe they do it. They'd be surprised when we step the fire one of these days. It says you'll entertain people's unaware. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, you don't know when you're going to see one. <laughs> That's right. It's like we were low on money, and that was after we lived here. And the Lord said that he, he was going to, he told the rest of us to do down here, that he would go down to the bank, and there would be a woman who would drop some money, and that when he looked up, he couldn't find her. And it was our thought, $30. I think it was $30. And he, he saw her and looked up, but uh, he, he never could find her. She dropped the money right outside the bank down here on on uh, on uh, Lombard and uh, one that goes across the bridge. Right. Huh? Yeah. She dropped the money, and I reached down and picked it up and turned around and had to her. She wore white slacks and a brown sweater, just as plain as plain could be. Looked around to give it to her, nobody there. Never did find her. Never did find her. And another time, Denny's reminded me that to her. Uh, the Lord spoke to us that uh, he would, he was blind, I think, at that time. And he went out, he would go out the front door and up above the door on the middle. He would find a piece of the house, but he would find the money, and he told us how. how denomination of the bills and all the sequence. But I can't remember that. Anyway, it was all it'd be all folded together and have a piece of the house on top of it. Well, piece of this it was a piece of this cement siding this, thing. Uh, that's best the siding was laying on top to hold it down. And he, he did. He went ran out the door and looked up and saw the money and reached up and got it. And somebody it. said there was a man just went around the corner and yeah, looked up that way there was a man went around the corner. The now, whether it was him or not, we don't know. How did the Lord speak that to you? Was it in a time of in prayer? Prophecy. In yeah. prophecy. You had a group. And the there tape recorder. Several. Uh, that was it. He spoke to the same church that morning. The tape recorder I had here for a good many years, the first one I ever had. Uh, the Lord laid upon my heart to get it so I could tape this stuff. It's a wood recorder. And I never had the money, and I didn't know how I could buy a tape recorder. The Lord said to go get it. You know where the, uh, the journal building used to be, sister? Down next to the river? That big journal building? The it's old journal down. building is torn it's down now. Out. Well, the street that goes used to go right into the front door of it, you know. We stood down there. I was standing down there on my way to get that thing. And I looked down, and was, here comes something rolled up down the curb, and it rolled up against my foot. It looked like a cigarette, only it was the wrong color. I reached down and picked it up, and it was like, it was five twenty dollar bills rolled up. Oh. The rubber band right. Just what he needed to pay down on <laughs> recorder. <laughs> wow, Glory. that's a lot. <laughs> it's marvelous what the Lord has done. And he, I don't question if we needed help again, he'd do it again. What do you do you see uh, your experiences and your life? serving a purpose in the body of Christ, the experiences that the Lord has given to you, do you see it as a purpose for the body of Christ in the last days? Well, that's purpose if it's accepted. <laughs> what do you think that's that the hard is? part. What do you Dennis, think that purpose is, sister? There's yes, a letter underneath that the envelope there. there. Right there. But so many people, they're skeptical. And you can't break through the Only the can break through it. When this is over, there's a letter you might read that might give you some information concerning what the Lord has used it for. This man here, I designed, I mean, I drew a rose 
painted the rose. And this man has taken that drawing. You, I showed you that rose. He sold over 30,000 uh, glasses and mugs and things with that rose engraved on it. Now he's, and here, the, you've heard about Women to Glow? They're going to use it. Women to Glow are going to use it. And this is a letter he's written to them concerning that. And in that letter, he's told them about how the Lord showed me the Word of God as a great big Bible. One page was the words. The other page was the, so it was a motion picture screen showing me the word in action over on one side and the words on the other side. He's got it all in here. In a letter to the so, so these these purposes, this purpose, sister, Rose, you said that uh, you felt it was to bring us into a deeper walk with the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't realize that God can do anything, and if they're just believed, they know He can do anything. But not anything He can do. But the thing that. The thing that's always puzzled me, and it still does, is why the Lord chose me. Born like I was. My mother, I found my mother. I don't remember exactly how old I was. 35. It's been 35. I found her in uh, San Diego, California. Went down to visit a brother. Of course, it was not my own brother. But it was a brother, one, brother, one of my brothers that I obtained when I was adopted. And he said to me, why don't you see if you can find some of your own family? So, without thinking much of it, just figured it would just be something to do. I got the telephone book, and I knew my mother's last name was Strat. So I got the phone directory, and I looked down through the Strattons, and all of a sudden I found one that got bigger, it seemed like it got bigger and bigger and bigger. So I called it and lo and behold it was my mother's brother. The only one that I called it was my mother's brother. And I told him who I was and uh, asked first where she was and he said she's in San Diego. This was in San Francisco when I called. That's where my brother was. And she said, she's in uh, San Diego, and I said, well, what is her name? He says, well, her name is Spaulding. And I said, what's her husband's name? He said, Guy. He works for a construction company down there. And I said, you happen to have her address? And uh, so he gave it to me. He said, hey, by the way, he said, who are you? And I said, I'm her son. And then he swore, he said, oh, no, you're not. She never had any kids. But I'd already gotten all I needed. So lo and behold, I sent a telegram down to her, and I put it on there, your son, Robert. And uh, the next day I got a telegram back from her, your mother. And so I went to see her. And we had a blessed time together, it seemed to be. She seemed to accept me, and I had a lovely time together. And then she came up to see us up here in Portland when I lived across the street from that church we were telling you about where this pastor was. But just about four or five years ago, she called me on the telephone and she didn't want anything more to do with me. So a second time rejection. Why, I don't know. She's dead as far as I'm concerned now, I guess. She'd be 80. See, I'm 73. That makes her 88. So I don't know if she's alive or not. She took back her old her maiden name because her I think her husband died. Mm -hmm. So she took back her maiden name. And one time I did call and ask the police to check on and see if she was all right. And they found her and checked and said that Mrs. Uh, Ursula Stratton was all right, but she had nothing to do with me. So you don't know why the Lord chose you? Did you ever pray and ask for a deeper walk or to be used in, in a oh, greater I've way? That. I've done that a long time before that ever happened, any of this. 
And when I consecrated myself to the Lord when I got saved, you know, it was that song, I'll go where you want me to go, I'll do what you want me to do, I'll say what you want me to do, stay over the mountains, over the oceans, and all that. And he holds you to what you say. You know. So we've, we've had a rough time all our life on pioneer works, you know. We never had a fancy time of it. <laughs> this is but, the best but he put poem you it. we've ever had. This is the best poem, I mean, in, uh, physically house it's the best we've ever had and it is paid for the new roof is paid for we don't owe anything on it and we're and our third son okay. is Dennis and uh, he is born all mixed up he's mixed up on the inside and he can't see good and uh, has bad hands and but he's got the talent that God gave him. Then he had uh, I had rectal polyps and one of them came out. I'd always have to put it back in so he could finish his stool, you know. And so this one time, one uh, part of it broke off of the sides of a kidney bean and the us and the blood was coming out of the us. And I was scared to death. Nobody would take me to the doctor. No, nothing. I just had to leave on the Lord. Then when we moved from there, from that pastor's pastor in North Bonneville, then there's a Fort Rains a tourist camp, and then Stevenson, Washington. And we moved into the tourist camp. We didn't have it enough to send the kids any lunch to school, except I had to borrow the baking powder from my uh, landlord to make biscuits, and we just took plain biscuit to school. And, uh, so from that, they delivered us a gallon of milk every morning and uh, and sent eight carloads of groceries in. Well, he was only three years old, and, and he wouldn't let us put him in the cupboard. He didn't have cupboards to hold him in, and all the food that we brought. And he put his little hands up, tear running down his face. He had to praise the Lord for we could put anything on him. His hand on every one of those pieces of articles and pray over thank the Lord for it. Those are, those are the precious times that you go right. through. Even when you're having such a hard time to even support the kids, you know. But then they were hungry. And you sit down at the table, nothing on the table to eat, and thank the Lord for the food, and then somebody knock on the door. My husband don't really care for this. Thought maybe you folks could hear this, so we had something to eat. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let it better cost them all. <laughs> <laughs> That's happened more Then there than was once. another time we, when we lived there, we went to Stevenson to work in the church there. And this woman had a garden, so she raised the summer squash and cabbage and whatever, you know. So she brought it to the church put in a box. And this time it was a summer squash, that yellow cooking, and uh, cabbage. We had that for three days, three times a day, and never got tired, and we still like it. <laughs> Morning, noon, and night. Squash and cabbage. <laughs> As as we're drawing to a close, uh, okay. we want to we want to talk about the pyramid. The Lord the Lord showed you something in the Great Pyramid. If you could share that. With us. Well, the the Great Pyramid in the center of the Great Pyramid is an opening at the top. You perhaps know that it's it's general knowledge, and there is a. Uh, a time calendar, whether you want to call it that or not, in the center that they have the Egyptians put in that. At the bottom of that thing, which is in a chamber that has not been opened, and there's no way to get into it except by finding it. And they're trying to find the opening, they haven't found it yet. But at the bottom of that thing, the Lord let me see it. At the bottom of that thing, is the date when Jesus will return. And the wonderful thing about it is, man's time, man's number is 666. God's number is 777, which is 21. 21 added together is 3. God's number is 3. Man's number is 18 because it's three sixes. 
what is 1 and 8 is 9. And you take 9 divided by 3 and you get 3 threes, don't you? That's man in 3 is a body, soul, and spirit. Man in God is body, soul, and spirit. Man in the Holy Spirit is body, soul, and spirit. So God unites man. He's got man, body, soul, and spirit in the Father, in the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Scripture speaks of it that way. At the bottom of that pyramid, when they get into it and find it, it'll have the date when Jesus will return to take his loved ones home. You said the Lord showed you in the Spirit the um, secret passageway and, and you saw something there. Yeah, that's it. About the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant is is there in the pyramid. The, uh, they uh, found it, uh, the, uh, oh, the Ark, uh, that, not the Ark, the, uh, yes, the Ark, the, the one Noah made. You know, they said they found it up on the mountain, Mount Ararat. They claimed they found part of that. Well, they did. They found part of it. But the Ark of the Covenant is in the basement of the building of the temple that was destroyed in Jerusalem. But when they destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, they buried the Ark in the basement and did not know they did it. And that's where it is. It's buried where? In the basement oh. of the temple in Jerusalem that was destroyed. You see, they'll never have any more, any more to do with the Christian. It was under the law. It was done away with. Yes. Is that the place where they're digging now? Digging everything out. They're digging everything out. They're going to rebuild this in the New Jerusalem. They're going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. You know, they're trying to. But he'll come before they get it done. Yes. <laughs> do you believe that these are the last days? I sincerely do. Definitely. Now, there are many nations uh, in the world right now that are close to the gospel. They've got border guards. They yes. will not allow Christians to come in. They will not allow, they, they watch very closely that no one smuggles Bibles into these nations. And God said that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all the nations as a witness to the whole world, and then the end shall come. So I believe that in the last days, God will translate ministers and people mm -hmm. behind those closed doors, That's that right. the gospel cannot be shut out. Do you believe, do you believe that God yeah. is going to be doing this? Do you remember the time we went to that dead hunting tribe? Vaguely, yes. That no one could go to? I vaguely remember. And but it was a short You remember short. how the, you lit the stick? Yeah, I lit the stick and stuck it in the ground. And it didn't burn. I mean, it didn't burn up. It didn't consume it. It burned and burned. Up, up till that time, they wouldn't destroy it. It was three, three days and three long. nights that sticks burned and never destroyed it. And I got a chance to talk to them. And I told them about, now I don't know how in the world I did it because I couldn't speak their language. At least I didn't think I was. I spoke English to them, I thought, but maybe I spoke their language. But it sounded like English to me. But they accepted him after the stick burned and stayed burning. So this was a sign to these mm -hmm. tribal and people. Had to God be. translated you to right. these tribal people, and that you put a stick in the ground, and it burned, and it was I not lit. consumed. Mm -hmm. You lit it, and it was not consumed right. for three days. And now there's a church there. Praise yeah. God! Do you know where? I it think is? it's a Pentecostal church. I'm not uh, sure. Pentecostal Church of God. I think. I'm not too sure, but I think. Is that in Africa? I don't remember exactly where it is. I think it is. Somewhere. I, it's just so many things as I can't remember. The Lord showed you some things about um, the last days and the Antichrist. And do you feel free to share anything Antichrist about Antichrist is a man about 47 years old. He's alive now. He's alive. And uh, it would be easier to think that this guy uh, what's his name? Zarephath. No. no. Gaddafi. 
Yeah. It would be easy to think he's it because there's a the word for love. Sounds like it. Agape. Agape. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. But it's come to me several times that that could be the Joker right there. Because everything they've done to get rid of the Joker is missed. They come so near getting him and missed him. Every time they missed him. And it's his idea to take over Israel. He wants it so bad he can taste it. The Lord took him when when he was in the Orient or wherever he was, when he was in the war, the, the Antichrist. He saw him when he was in the war. Mm. But I don't know if that's the one. But the two name, two words are so similar. Now, I don't know what his name means. It, it may not have a meaning, and maybe it does. But it's so similar to the word above in that language that I thought to myself, I wonder, I just wonder. So the Lord showed well. you that he is approximately 47 years old. Yeah. He is alive now. Uh, I don't know how old this guy is. I don't have any idea. But he has moved from where he saw when he was a little boy. He's now yeah, there. He's in another place. Yeah. But that, of course, don't mean it. He couldn't, couldn't necessarily mean anything. Has the Lord showed you any more about the last days and what's going to happen? Not. Not really well. In Five years or more since I said that. I guess maybe because we tell, I don't know. You believe the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back in our time? I wouldn't be a bit surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't be a bit surprised. You know, the scripture says, were it not that he come quickly, there'd be none left and the way things are going. I wouldn't trust that your, that Russian crowd over there. I wouldn't trust them with anything, nothing. What they're doing right now is to get us where they can put us out of commission. Their talk is absolutely, absolutely treachery. And I don't understand why. Our president don't, under, don't realize that. I'm praying that God will show it to him. I believe the man loves the Lord. But he really got saved. Yes, he did. Sister Hansel was there when he got the baptism. She probably told you, didn't she? But he has to hold on to that. And I don't know how much he hold on to, held on to if he still holds on to that experience from God. If he still loves the Lord like he did then, I don't know. He better. Because he needs all God's help he can have. What has the Lord been showing you about the body of Christ and where the body of Christ is right now? Is there, is there something that you can share with us? You, you've had many years uh, serving Well, it's in a precarious position because of what's going on right now. This horrible shake. thing that's going to shake up, it's going on right now. Or the, when you start talking about yourself, what I mean by that, when you can't trust yourself, like what's going on, talking about themselves. The man that did wrong, he confessed he did wrong. He asked God's forgiveness. I understand he did that seven years ago. I don't know what he did after that. But if he did, so what? Who is that I or anybody else should bring it up and put it nationwide and cause hundreds and maybe more than that to say I don't want any part of this this gospel stuff. It, it's terrible. Now, I don't go along with some of the things he may do, some of the things he may believe, but I still say this, I have no right to condemn the man for something he did seven or eight years ago and ask God to forgive him for. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. The Word says, if any man said they have no sin, he's a liar and deceiving himself. And the truth is not in him. He's pretty much of a liar if there's no truth in him. And the Bible says there isn't any in him if he says he has no sin. That man, I love him. I don't know him personally, but I love him because I saw, I've seen what he's done, what his wife has done since that. 
And don't give the others any right to condemn him and bring him down to the, in the dirt. We've all done something we shouldn't have done. I don't care who we are. I wouldn't want people to know what I did. Uh, we had our bread and cakes and German cooking. The best cooking in the world. <laughs> Cut off because we preached that we sin every day. Yeah. <laughs> but we still believe it. <laughs> we Naz they were Nazarenes, saved, sanctified, petrified, and laid aside. And they wouldn't have nothing to do with us after we, I preach and we sin every day. Boy, they cut us off like that. They want nothing more to do with us. That's not God's Two way of doing it. Two different types of God got that way. One time I was down in Southern Oregon. They brought us one of these big two-pound cracker boxes, you know, full of eggs every week. And uh, other things they brought. They brought milk to us. We preached what they didn't like, why they cut them off. <laughs> one of our little boys, just a little fellow, they cut the milk off and his... Uh, the one younger than him. Yeah, younger him. than he. What was it happened? They, we had to go to Idaho for some reason. The Lord told us to go and so these other ministers, I don't know, you know, Sister Riddle, do you know her? And they stayed with the kids because they lived in the other part of the house. And they stayed with the kids, took care of them, and so they made the... Sunday school superintendent mad, so then they cut off the milk. He was just a baby. And so he lost his fingernails, like when you mash your finger and you lose your fingernails. And his toenails and fingernails and his black hair was turning white because he didn't have any calcium. And God used a sinner. He walked like an ape, looked like an ape, you know. Yeah. He never came to church. His wife had come to church, but she, he used him to bring us milk and dig our well when the water ran dry. And the, the, the Sunday school superintendent went across the street to his house and killed the goat while he was having church. Killed it right there where, you know, and brought where in the body. That was just a few of the things we went through. They that live righteously shall. Yeah. What about there was a blessing when we went moved from Stevenson down to uh, Cape Junction down near Cape Junction, London, London. And the sister Little took us down in her car. She had a Dodge business coupe, and she, when she got down there, she, she pulled our trailer with a washer and everything behind it, you know, and the kids were sleeping in the trunk. We got down there, and, she, and something was wrong with the wheel, so she took the wheel off, and the bearing was all ground and the grinding. There was nothing left to it, you know, it was grinding. She puts the wheel back on, and she drives three miles to the service station. You, can, you don't do that. It had to be the Lord. <laughs> that, that, yeah, we ran three miles on, on the vapor <laughs> one time, too, and then when he was going down the highway, going down the Southern Oregon one time, in the same car, we, there was no place on the side of the road. The truck was in our lane, there was no place to go around him. The Lord just took it around out, in the air. this way, and we were going that way. We ran around in the air. Went around right out in the open, there was no place to Wasn't go. on the road. <laughs> and going up. Stevenson one time when we were up there, the Lord spoke to us and told us to stop. And we stopped and just before we, just as we got stopped, there was a great big boulder big in that TV lit right in front of the car. We hadn't stopped it with his. Rolled down the mountain and ran on the highway out in front of us. Another time he told us to slow down because there was a, somebody in a car was just racing and he raced right in front of us. Have you ever heard the Lord speak in an audible voice to you? Yes. Every time I, he spoke to me, he's been audible to me. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as anyone else hearing him, I don't know. Have you ever seen the Lord? Yes, I've seen him. 
he looks just like a man. Apparently the reason for that is so I would be able to, to accept it, to be able to receive it. But it was, it was a, a glowing view. I mean, it was illuminated, so bright, just blinding. But I could still tell. And the pictures they have of him, uh, I've seen a few that look like him, somewhat. He looked like the, uh, he looks like some of the pictures you see that they portray of him, because he was human in the flesh. Yes. But he's so glorified that it takes away from that. I mean, there's no way of explaining it. But the only way you see God. You don't see God at all. Is his glory. Is the glory, just the fact that he's there. I saw the throne. And the glory that was on the throne, but you don't see any figure. Uh -huh. You can't see it. Now, I don't really know for sure uh, whether we'll see that God, when we get there or not, we probably will. But no man has seen God at any time, the scripture tells us that, live. and lived. Now, I don't know. He's never let me know. I probably won't know no one else will when we get there. Does the, does the Lord Jesus speak to you when you see him? He spoke to me, yes. He has. He has spoke to me. You but are. he spoke to me in a language I understood. He spoke to me in my own language. Why not? He knows all of them. Has there ever been any time in, in this period of, of 37 years where you have desired to have these experiences that your husband has had? Well, yes or no, I mean, maybe just whatever the Lord wants. Whatever the Why, why do you think, uh, why do you think these experiences happen to you? Do you think there's, there's, um, a, a, a reason? Sister, I don't know. That's like I said a little while ago, why did you choose me? Me of all. Why? I think it's just because we will. Look, there's Billy Graham. Why not him? There's Brother Roberts. Why not him? There's Jimmy Swaggart. Why not him? They're out there where millions hear him. Who am I? They don't even listen to me when I talk to them on the street. Why me? I'm a nobody. Why did he give it to me? But back there, I was in the tent meetings, and I had big crowds, and people come in. They come in, and I, the Lord, let me know that somebody had a great big goiter. I didn't know who they were. The Lord let me know, and I'd say, a lady in a certain seat, so many seats from the end of the from the aisle, back so many rows, has a goiter. She come up, we'll pray for her, and the Lord will heal her, and it happened. But that was in the meeting, and that's been years ago. It's over. It's, it hasn't happened. And the other night I listened to a colored brother. He was preaching real great. And he come out with this one. He said, anybody that's sick and having problems, he said, what? they must not have any good relations with God. They're not doing what they should. They're not living right. He said, why, if you're living right, you're not sick anymore. Oh, that's the case. You never die either, would you? This body deteriorates. It happens. It gets old. It gets old. It, it's just natural. I'm sick. My wife isn't well. And I can testify for over 50 years this wife of mine has lived a pure life. And any guy sat up there and say that she's not living for God, I'd tell him right in his face he's a liar. I ought to know. Why isn't she healed? That turned me off. I turned him off, too. And if I can't take it, what do you think the world thinks of it? That it has nothing to do with God anyhow. You think that I win a man who's got a wife that's sick, or he's sick, and he doesn't know the Lord? Getting right with God doesn't heal the body. It heals the soul. We believe it might heal people. the body. We were leaving by noon and sure, I do my too. brother was healed of infantile paralysis and double curvature in the spine when he was, I think, two, three years old. 
And I saw that he just stretched like a baby waking up, you know. Straighten up. And I've seen other demons and I we believe in God. Absolutely, I believe in it. But there's a purpose for But you can't force God to do it. And I'll tell you one thing, we being like we are, our boys that are unsaved, when they come here, they love us, they put their arms around us, they hug us and make over us. It's drawing them to God. Well, I prayed, They'll stand and cry. I prayed when my last boy was 13 and went wild because it became a teenager soon, so you have to go wild. Yeah, so. And it just like killed me. In fact, I haven't been able, I always sang all the time, all the time when I sang. And I can't do that since then. But uh, he, he comes now, and the Lord, I prayed, Lord, if it'll take my life to bring him in, take my life. Well, he's allowed me to have this ailment now, and it's touching him. That's right. If, he, if so, we were well and strong and robust and everything, they wouldn't be coming around because Mom and Dad don't need them. But Mom and Dad need them now, so they come. So why, why should we say what God should do? I can't tell God, will you heal me in spite of what I, you know, tell God what to do. He tells me what to do. I don't tell him what to do. I don't go along with that. I don't go along with it, sis. Well, he has his place. Minister. It's what Job did to get all the punishment he got. Yeah, what did he do? <laughs> I don't know, have you heard him play the organ? Well, a little bit. Uh, I don't think your husband's seen his hands. Show him your hands. He, he's rated with the top organist in Portland, Oregon. He's been pitched not very long ago. And it's no less than... And on the piano. It, I think it's even more fantastic on a piano in there than on an organ because you've got to play, use your finger differently on the piano you do on an organ because you lay your hands on the organ and play. But you know, yeah. on the piano you've got to use your fingers more. The only music he so. can learn is just what they taught in school. That's all he you know. It's all God given him. Are the lights to be bright in there? Can we... Uh, we just want to close this part of the, the videotaping and we pray that it's been a blessing to you. We pray that the Lord has uh, just excited you about what he's going to do, what he has done, and what he's going to do. We want to close it with Brother Grubb's son, Dennis Grubb's playing. He's got the whole world in his hand, and the Lord Jesus Christ does, and we'll just close with that.